right, we're good, we're going. So, I titled this message, If Not Now, When? If not now, when? If you're not going to get serious about prayer, when? If you're not going to get serious about God, when? If you're not going to get um, whatever, whatever blank you want to fill in there, then when? Because guess what? We're a week older than we were last week when I started the message. So if you didn't last week, then when are you going to do it? And again, like I said, it reminded me of Joseph's ordination, and I met Joseph's father-in-law, and God spoke to me to tell him he's not done with him yet. Now, I just noticed also on Facebook, they had their 62nd anniversary, so I would dare say he's probably in his 80s. And God said, hey, you're not done with you yet, and I'm not going to redo that whole story. You can look at that, and what that reminded me of was Caleb. Remember Caleb, at 85 years old, said, give me my inheritance, which was a mountain that had giants on it and great walled cities. At 85 years old. And he says, hey, I'm just as strong as I was back then when I scouted out the land 45 years ago. Because what we tend to do is we tend to, and we're going to get into that more, make excuses on why we can't do what God wants us to do. We make excuses. But the thing I want to just kind of reemphasize again about Caleb is, remember, God never spoke to Caleb. Caleb got the promise of God through Moses, the man of God. And that's what he called him. You know, remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God. Now, he's talking to Joshua. Now, this is the point I want to bring up. Joshua and him were buddies. Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land. Remember, they were the only two that came back with a good report. But now, guess what? what's happened now to Joshua? Now, Joshua is in charge. You know what I mean? Joshua got elevated to not being a buddy anymore. He's now in charge. He got put in place of Moses, the man of God. Now who gets to the man of God? Joshua. But you know what's interesting? Caleb still respected Joshua for the position that he had. And he didn't overstep his bounds in dealing with his buddy, Joshua. He still went to him respectfully. He said, hey, remember this that went on? He didn't demand anything. He didn't pull any favor cards or whatever we like to call it today. He still respected him and treated him for the position that he had even though he knew him. <clears throat> and again, what we read about Caleb was, what God said about him, well, he was a man that was distinct. He had a different spirit, remember? And the thing that made him distinct is he had respect for leadership. And that has to re-enter the body of Christ, guys. It's got to re-enter the body of Christ. We don't have respect for the man of God anymore. And I'm not just talking here. I'm talking in general. Okay, I'm just talking generally thinking respect has left the building in all of society. <laughs> now, that's not news. But again, we had this little mini discussion Wednesday night about this piece. And the thing was, how has that, um, what word can we call it? Disrespect of the world crept into the church. Why has that happened in the church? I mean, I just get real personal with you. I'll talk about me. I don't want to talk about anyone else because I'm sure we've all dealt with it. But I would never deal with a preacher that I've had in the past the way people have dealt with me. Never. Never would have even thought of it. Never would have said the things to another pastor that have been said to me. And it looked like, what's wrong with me? Well, God told me a long time ago, and he pointed to the story of Moses. He said, what did he say to Moses? They didn't upset with you, they upset with me. You know why, Moses, you're representing me. You know why, Jim, you're representing me. He mad at you. He mad at me. But you know what? You're still a person. And it still kind of hurts. You know what I mean? So even though you get the biblical perspective of it, the revelation of it, it's still just not decent and courteous in the world to just treat one another and disrespect one another in that type of fashion. And the thing that was interesting is 
Caleb didn't do that, even though he probably had a pretty good relationship with Joshua. Still treated him with respect. Still went to him because he was the leader to get his inheritance like everyone else did because they were doling out the inheritances at that time. Reminded him of the story. Didn't push anything. Treated him that way. And I just want to remind you of a couple of scriptures in Hebrews and we're just going to drop it. We're just going to put it out there and like I said, I keep giving Glee credit for this no more because I've given it to you two or three times. So now I'm just going to steal it, but tag your it. Here's a scripture, tag your it, but you do with it now. It's on you. But Hebrews 13, 7 in the voice translation says this, Listen to you leaders who have spoken God's word to you. Notice the fruits of their lives and mirror their faith. Hebrews 13, 7, 17 out of the Passion Translation says this, Obey your spiritual leaders and recognize their authority. For they keep watch over your soul without resist, <clears throat> without resting, since they will have to give an account to God for their work. So it will benefit you when you make their work a pleasure and not a heavy burden. I'm going to talk about my wife in a second. <laughs> Just what went on this weekend. I'm not going to give all the details, but we're at the leadership meeting and people ask, you know, kind of what's going on in your world or whatever. We get to Robin and ask her, what can we pray for you about? You know, some of the ways heavy on her, she sees and hears everything people say about me and how they treat me. And she's like, that's the guy I love. That's my husband. But know what she also sees, which none of you see, how I am at home. And the reading and the studying and the praying and all the stuff I put into. So imagine what she's seeing. People have blatantly lied, accused. And she's sitting there saying, who are you talking? I don't even know the man you're talking about. And it really blessed me that she opened up Friday night and we all got around and prayed for her. Because like we said, she just got tossed into this thing, you know. She sat in the pew just like you. Then all of a sudden God put us together. Then all of a sudden instantly she becomes a preacher's wife. I didn't send her like he did me and Mary when we were over there and sent us here. When I went into ministry, Mary was there. She walked the whole journey that way. She got thrown into the fire. And she hears all that. So I'm not, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm far from boo-hooing. I'm just talking about me because we can march 100 people up here to tell you the same stories. But what I'm trying to say is, what he says here, recognize their authority. I'm not here because I want to be here. I told you that story before. <laughs> It's a God thing I'm here. It's a God thing I'm still here. Because I fear Him more than all the stuff that's happened. You know what I mean? Now I'm sharing this because you need to have the same information in your life because people that can't even respect and show respect to someone they see face to face, don't tell me you respect God and love God. And you listen to God and you follow God. No, you don't. Because if you can't like he says in 1 John, if you can't even love and take care of the needs of the one you see, don't tell me you love me. Because we model it. So again, what we've got to get back into the church is respect. And no longer tolerate disrespect. And don't jump on the bandwagon with it. Now again, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's not about me. Just using me. These are all examples about what I'm saying. Can you relate? That's what an example is, so you can relate to the point. The point is what? Respect for the leadership of the house of God is gone. Because everybody just wants to be buddies. That's not how it works. That's not how God set up kingdom. Okay? And it doesn't make the leader any better than anyone else. We understand all that. But he says, recognize your authority and obey the spiritual leaders, why? 
and listen to them. First, recognize the authority. Then listen to the authority. Then obey the authority. Now again, we understand that doesn't just blindly mean do what somebody tells you to do. But like you said, if they model them, if you see the fruit, if you see all their faith, then you mirror that. That's why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So again, there's probably been times I've come across a little bit unloving because no one likes to be falsely accused of anything, do they? I lied about it. I told stories about it. Because we're still people too, right? Yeah. We're still people too. So I keep praying for my wife because it hurts. This is all new to her. I got 30 years under my belt, guys. 30 years in October, the first Sunday of October, I planted my first church 30 years ago. Been around this bush a lot. Three years. Blows her away how vicious Christians can be. Sheep bite. Sheep bite. Some of those sheep have <coughs> goats there too, in sheep's clothing. There you go. So again, we're not boo hooing. No. But we gotta understand this authority thing came from him, right? right. He's the one who wrote it. Right. So again, we need the proper respect and the proper understanding of it. Not the way the world teaches, but this is kingdom stuff. And that's the one thing we learned from Caleb with Joshua. They were buddies, they were good friends. But you know what? Caleb still treated Joshua with the proper respect for the position that he held. Didn't mean they couldn't go out and cut it up and have a good time and, you know, sit around and have some burgers and dogs and watch the, the Bruins win the Stanley Cup and whatever and just have a grand old time. That's not it. But when Joseph stood in his position, Caleb recognized that position and treated him appropriately. Because when you're sitting around watching TV and dogs and jumping and screaming and watching the hockey game is different than when Joshua was standing before all the nation declaring what God had for them, right? right. <clears throat> That's what we got to understand. And get that back in to the church house. Because how are we going to attract them out there if we are just like them out there? What's the point? Mm -hmm. If there's no difference in our lives, because we attract them by the goodness and kindness of God. We attract them because we ain't like them. And they're wondering why we ain't like them. So if we're still like them, then we got to look on the inside and find out why am I still like them? What's going on? So we get the point? You understand? Okay. Again, it ain't about me. Then I'll keep on going. I'm going to continue to get lied on and all that stuff. I get it. Just do me a favor, pray for that woman over there. I get a lot more road rash about that deal than she does. So anyway, on Easter we talked about that Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I've sent you, right? Father has sent me, I've sent you. So we close it out. And in 2 Corinthians 5.18 in the voice translation, it says that he has given us the same mission. Now, I'm going to preach all that again. But he's given us the same mission, and that ministry is called the Ministry of Reconciliation to bring back people to him. So get it. Jesus sent us like the Father sent him. So we're on mission. And this is the mission. Because people always want to know, what I don't know what God wants me to do. Okay? Turn your head off. Turn your ears on. I'm about to tell you. Okay? So here's the answer to the question you keep asking. He wants you to bring people back to him. Like somebody brought you back to him. You're to do what he did. That person did for you. You're to point people back to him. That's your mission. Now how that unfolds and how that manifests, yes, to the callings and the giftings and everything else he's given you and the uniqueness you have, but the foundational mission has never changed. Bringing people back to Jesus. That's why he came. To open that door. Now if you ain't doing that, that's not a good thing not to be doing. But a lot of times we don't do that because we get to be like Moses and make excuses over there in Exodus chapter 3. 
Remember in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is out feeding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and he sees the bush burning, and he goes, man, that's pretty cool. That bush is burning, and it ain't getting consumed. So he goes over there, and he starts walking over there, and God figures out, he got his attention now. He stops him and says, hey, Moses, this is holy ground. You better take your shoes off. And then they get into a discussion, right? And God is telling him about how he sees the plight of his people in Egypt, and da-da-da, he's going on and on. And then we get down to verse 10 is where I want to, want to pick this up. In verse 10 he says, now go. It sounds familiar. It sounds like Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus said, go into all the world. Go. Go. He tells Moses, now go for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You may lead my people out of Egypt. Now, we won't get into all the back history, but for Moses to go back to Pharaoh and do this would have cost him his life. Because he didn't leave Egypt on good terms. No. In fact, he left Egypt as a murderer. So remember, as the Father has sent me, I sent you. I've given you all the same ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, bring people back to the Father. Okay? Now Moses launches into what we call his excuses. Let's see if some of them fall into the category maybe you've used over time when God has spoken to you. First thing in verse 11, it's interesting because it says, but Moses <clears throat> protested to God. He protested. I don't know all he protested. It just says he protested to God. That was the first thing he says, who am I? To appear before Pharaoh. Who am I to lead the people out of Egypt? Know what his first excuse revolved around? His identity. Who am I? Who am I to do this thing you're asking me to do? Who am I? He had an identity issue. The lie he was believing is he lacked the qualifications to do what God was calling you to do. If God has given us all that mission, guess what he has done? Qualified us for the mission. Because this ain't about you and whether you feel you're qualified. It's not about your feelings or my feelings at all. It's about obedience to the call, to the mission that he's put before us. And Moses protested right off the bat. Hold on, God. Who am I? The one he just chose and called. That's who you are. Who are you? You're a son of the living God. A child of the king. You have all things that pertain to life and God in this right now. You can do all things through Christ that will strengthen you. But you know what you have know that as? As an intellectual understanding of the Word of God. You don't have any heart revelation of that thing. Now how do you know you have a heart revelation of that thing? You go through all the junk that I've been through for 10 years. Then you know you get a heart revelation of the thing. And you don't quit. And you keep going on. Again, I'm using me as an example so I won't upset you because some of you have got the same stories. But sometimes when you point out other people, you get in trouble. So again, I ain't tooting the horn. I'm just giving an example. Don't focus on the example. But the thing is, if the Word of God is real in your life, there will be fruit from it. Just like all the folk that badmouthed me over all these 10 years around here in Concord, where are they? They ain't sitting here. Who's still here? Where are they? That's what I mean. It, it, what's the fruit? Where's the fruit? Like you said, you just don't obey and submit cause. No, no, no. Follow the fruit and then mirror the faith. This is what he said in Hebrews 13, 7. So where's the fruit? If there ain't no fruit, you're just tooting. I don't want to hear you on. You're sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. No, it's the fruit. So Moses answers that. I'm not going to go through all the answer and the excuses. I just want to touch on the excuses this morning. Go and read, read it for yourself. So now in verse 13, Moses comes up with another one. He says, but Moses protested. <coughs> and I love this comment. If I go, I ain't telling you I'm going, but if I go to the people 
of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me, they will ask me, what is his name? And what should I tell them? So what's his excuse now? He's got an authority issue. It's his name. He's believing that I lack the credibility and the authority. So who the heck am I? I got an identity issue. And these kind of all build on each other. And then he says, what do we tell him? The authority issue. The credibility issue. And the Lord says, tell him I am who I am. I am who I am who sent you. Don't you understand what God sends us on a mission? We ain't going in our own strength, our own power, or anything else, our own authority or anything. You've got no authority. Can you understand you're stinking dead? You're dead. You're dead. You had to die at the cross so you could pick up his life. You can't have your life and his life together. You had to give him your life in exchange for his life. It's an exchange that occurred. The divine exchange. We like to sing it. I don't think we understand what it meant. No, no, no. I took this thing and gave it to him. He graciously gave him, gave that to me. It's by his divine nature I now live. I took my sin nature and said, hey, you take this, and he gave me his divine nature. That's whose authority I'm going under. His. I don't have any. Never had any. Your position don't give me any authority. Nothing. He gave it. We took his name. We made him our Lord. We confess with your mouth Jesus as your Lord. That's when we got it. And you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. We think, okay, now we're saved, and we can just do this thing in our own power and our own authority, our own credibility. No! It's still only by His power and authority. That's what Moses was wondering. I ain't got no credibility. I ain't got no authority. Who am I going to tell him sent me? At least he understood that. People today think they can just barge in in their own power and authority, like you're something special. No, we ain't. I bet you we all put on our pants the same way this morning. Unless you're wearing a dress. You won't see me in a dress, so I'll use that example. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I was saying, so when you said, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, and he went through that. Moses already got two strikes. I'm wondering when he's going to quit. I can relate to that, because sometimes I'll go back and forth with God a couple times. But I've learned the longer I keep it going, the worse it ends up for me. So I've learned after the first one now, when I protest the first time, if it comes back to me again, I'm done. You got it, God. You got it. Moses ain't learned that lesson yet, because now he's on number three in Exodus 14, in Exodus 4, verse 1. It says, but Moses protested again. Okay, so sending you, so how am I going to do this? You're going in my name, and you're going in my authority. He ain't got it yet. So he protested it again. What if they won't believe me? Or listen to me? Or what if they say the Lord never appeared to you? So now he's got a faith issue. Well, they won't believe me. Again, it ain't about you. Why? Do you understand we can't control what the other person thinks or believes? <laughs> We're not told to control what the other person thinks or believes or to change their mind or to change their position or to change anything about them. We are declarers of the truth of the Word of God. Tag your it. Now whatever you want to do with it, that's your problem. That's what we do. But because we lack the faith that we think people won't believe us, we came up with this cute thing, a lie of the devil says, I don't want to give God a black eye. Do you think God cares about that? No. Really? Like you're all that in a bag of chips that God's sitting down here saying, oh, I hope Jim don't screw up today. He's going to give me a black eye. <laughs> Man, he's just going to ruin this whole thing. If he just says that one word off, he's going to mess this whole thing up. And man, I don't know what I'm going to do. Do you really think that way? you got to get this thing right, man. You need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I don't think God's sweating the things you're sweating. What if they don't believe me? He didn't tell 
tell them that they would believe you or not. He said, go and tell them. I am who I am sent you. And tell them what I tell you to say. So then he goes on and demonstrates a great miracle, right? What do you got in your hand? Staff, throw it down, turn it into a snake. Do you understand, though, that signs and wonders will follow those who believe? Oh, you want to see the power of God? Here you go. Again, it ain't you. You can't do nothing. But because he's in us and he's given us all things and he's given us the power and authority through the Holy Spirit, that's why you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Maybe some of these excuses will help you with that while you haven't for all these years. You get in your hand. You know, God wants to take what you've got in your hand and use it for his honor and glory. And you want this um, you want what you think you need to carry out the task. No, he said, what's in your hand? Nothing. Guess what? God made all of this out of nothing. I think he can take nothing and do pretty good with nothing. <laughs> so you ain't got nothing in your hand. You can still take that. And then he went on and said, hey, put your hand in your thing, came out, leprous, put it back in, clean again. You know, pour some water on the ground from the Nile River or turn it into blood. Even after all that, in verse number 10, but Moses pleaded with the Lord. He ain't protesting no more. Now he's pleading. This boy ain't giving up. What excuse number four? How much more do you need to see in your own life, Moses? Church, how much more do you need to see in your own life that God is with you and he's never going to leave you and forsake you and he cares about you? How much more do you got to see? How much more? You act like he ain't done a stinking thing for you. How much more? <clears throat> Here's my excuse right here. Number four. Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied. And my words get tangled. I can relate. Then the Lord said, Who made your mouth? Really? You're really going to go there? Who made your mouth? See, I get it, because I'm not a man of eloquent words. I tick people off of what I say. Let me just give you a couple, three examples. I got two I can remember. I had three, but I forgot the third one. Just in a clarification mode. Remember when I would stand up here and say, you don't pay me? And you can't pay me? Some people get mad at that. Now let me clarify. Okay? One reason I was saying that was because someone in this church actually refused to help clean the church and literally said out of their mouth, that's what I pay him for. There was a person that come to this church thought, I am hired by that person and part of my job is to clean the building. Wow. So that was behind some of what I was saying. But the other thing is, if you pay me, then what do I become that the scripture calls what? In John, a hireling. So if you pay me, then I work for you. That was the other thing I used to say. I don't work for you. You didn't call me here. No, again, I'm not being rude and I'm not being arrogant. But see, I get my words twisted up sometimes. Could I say that a little bit nicer? Yeah. And please, don't get me wrong. I'm not justifying what I'm saying. I'm just clarifying and explaining. Because I am not a man of very many words. I'm just kind of blend, straightforward, because my thing is I want to communicate the meaning that I'm sharing with you. And I've learned over the years, sometimes when I say some things, yeah, it can be misconstrued. It's the spirit that does that, you know. It's called Leviathan, twists things. <clears throat> but anyways. So when I say I don't work for you, that's what I'm meaning. I work for him. You didn't send me here, he did. Because like I said, I wanted no part of living in somebody God when I first was there. He sent me here. But because I feared him 
more than me not wanting to go, I gave up and said, okay, Lord. So that's what I mean and what I say. You don't pay me, I don't work for you. You know, here's the other one. I don't really care what you think. I don't care what you think. And I mean it in this context. And it goes way back to my first church. I had a woman come in my office, start asking me questions, and I shared with her what the Word of God had to say about it. She said, no, I don't want to know what God says about it. I want to know what you say about it. And I looked at her funny. What do you mean? No, no, I want your opinion. I don't want to hear what God says. I want to know what you think about it. I said, what I think is what he thinks. Now again, look at the setting we're in. We're in the church. We just went through service. She comes in and asks me a question. I'm in my role functioning as the pastor of the church, right? I'm Joshua. Do you understand we are ambassadors for Christ? We don't have an opinion. The only thing we legally have a right to say is what our king says. You don't have an opinion. Now again, if we're sitting around, we're eating dogs, watching the Bruins playing, and you're asking me what I think about Chara, I think he stinks. And we ought to get rid of him. Because there's a hickerance. I'll tell you my opinion in that setting. But we're in the house of God, we're discussing the things of God, or we're in a Bible study, or we're at whatever. Don't care what your opinion is or your thoughts. That's not what we're here for, to say what we think is right. The Bible says don't add to or take away from. It says in 1 Peter, the scriptures are not up for private interpretation. So again, I get misconstrued because I don't know a more eloquent way of saying it, I guess, but I don't care what you think. And you ought not to care what I think. Because if I'm not sharing with you what the Word of God is saying, who cares? We're just all giving an opinion. Let's all go to Dunkin' Donuts and buy some coffee and sit around the table and talk. But that's not why we're here, right? right. So again, I get the words thing. Because sometimes, I told this to Robin driving in. If you think what comes out of my mouth is bad, you should hear the stuff that I stopped before it came out of my mouth. <laughs> okay? You should... If you were in there, you wouldn't say, boy, that guy's got a problem. He needs to get saved, that guy. So if you're afraid of what comes out, you're doing good because what didn't come out, no. <laughs> so I get Moses. I'm not an eloquent speaker, God. I don't, you know, people misconstrue and they twist things and make up things and, you know, they come and tell me stuff that I never really even said. And So I get this one. You know what the Lord said? Hey, who made your mouth? Who made your mouth? He said, I will be with you as you speak. I'll be with you as you speak. He told who the prophet was a Jeremiah or whatever. Don't look at their faces. You tell them what I told you to say. You put your face like flint. You speak the word of God. Because you know what, Jeremiah, it ain't about you. You know what, Jim, it ain't about you. You are my ambassador to say what I need said on the earth to bring my kingdom to pass on the earth. And that's just not for me. It's for all of us in the ministry of reconciliation, guys. What they think, what they say is all irrelevant. Not because we don't care about them. We won't be insensitive. No, but when it comes to the word of God, we don't care what anyone thinks. Because he says what he means and he means what he says. Amen? Because it's all about him. Right. Now, if you disagree with it, tag, you're it. You're going to take it up with him one day. Guarantee yeah. you. <clears throat> You'll have your time face to face like Moses was doing. But let me give you the how to work out for him. Because he's going to give it one more shot. He is down in verse 13 in chapter 4. After all that, but Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Now, like I said, these all built upon each other. What's he dealing with now? Flat out rebellion. Flat out rebellion. What's the Bible called? Rebellion? Okay. Rebellion is as witchcraft. Flat out. Tell him the creator of the universe. No. That's like, wow. No. I 
can't do what you're asking me to do. You are absolutely right, Moses. You can't do anything God asks you to do because it's not by your mind, my, my, by your power, but by His Spirit, says the Lord. That's why you need His Spirit. Because there's a whole lot of people trying to do it their way and their own power and their own strength and their own intellect and all that stuff. That's not how the kingdom works. When He calls... He'll qualify, he'll empower, he'll do everything necessary to get his task done. All he needs is a mouthpiece here on earth, because he ain't here no more, remember? Who do you give authority to on the earth? These human bodies. <coughs> oh, it's cracking. Why didn't that? See verse 14, that's probably not a good thing to do. It says, then the Lord became angry with Moses. Not a good thing to do. I wonder how many times we make God angry in our regard and thinking it's no big deal. Just like little kids. You know, in the natural, two-year-olds, year and a half, two-year-olds. Your mom and dad are upset and they get no clue what they do and they think it's funny and it's no big deal. Maybe a little two-year-old Christians are doing the same thing with God. I wonder why God ain't showing up. You know, when you get angry at your child, like I have with my daughter, do you think you're in the place of blessing? Probably not. When you get told to go to bed, you're not eating. If you don't want to eat your supper, then you can go to bed. It's not a place of blessing and provision. Christians are running around all the time saying, where's God? Where's God? How come this you didn't get mad? How come that you didn't get mad? Because you're in witchcraft. Because he told you to do something and you completely rebelled against it. Let's, like I heard this way, we can bring this plane in for a landing and not crash it. It's okay, you didn't need that, Robin. Did. First Kings 18.21, out of the voice translation, is Elijah. But all the prophets of Baal, we know that story. They built an altar, he built an altar, and all that stuff. Went through that whole scene. And then Elijah, in verse 21, says this. Elijah, approaching the people, he says, How much longer will you sit on the fence? Refusing to make a decision between the Lord and Baal. And I believe the Lord's asking us that this morning. How much longer will you sit on the fence? I've told you that before. When you sit on a fence, and it's a picket fence, there's parts of that fence in places in my body I don't want them. It's not comfortable. And that's why a lot of Christians are miserable. Because they get the fence in parts of the body they ought not to be there and it's creating discomfort. He asked them, after all of what you just saw, let me say to you, after all you've just seen in your life that God has done for you in your life, How long are you going to sit on the fence? Refusing to make a decision between the Lord and Baal. He says, if you believe the eternal one is the true God, then devote yourself entirely to him. And if you believe Baal is your master, then devote yourself entirely to him. And all the people who gathered on the top of Mount Carmel were completely silent. They didn't know what to say about this. That's what the body of Christ is too today. We can knock the call now and say, if you want to devote yourself to Christ, you come down here. And there'll be people who just sit there. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourself this day who you're going to serve. If you think God ain't all that, and you don't think God's took care of you and all that stuff, then choose who you're going to serve, whether God or your father's, Go back to sin. You can turn away from them. I don't suggest it. You'll end up in a place that burns with fire for all eternity. Oh no, I believe I'll never lose my eternal security. Okay, give it a try. But it's a dangerous game you're playing. Oh no, what's I'm saying? No, I'm saying I can do whatever I want. I don't know if I want to play that game. Because the consequences can be pretty severe. <coughs> it says, 
says, here, choose who you're going to serve. Serve the Lord or go back and serve the fathers on the other side of the river and the gods of the Amorite. And who's laying it down? But, as for me and my house, baby, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen? We're going to serve the Lord. Made the decision. All in. Fully devoted. <clears throat> and just one more scripture to help you understand what's going on here. Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. This is out of the Living Translation. He says, today I have given you a choice. See, if not now, when? You don't have tomorrow. Really, Lord? Okay. You ain't got tomorrow. So we found out this past week, there used to be a kid that walked by my house nearly every day and worked at Hannaford's right up the street from my house. Found out this Wednesday he died. 37 years old. Don't know why. If not now, when? All I ever said to the kid was hi. Never told him about the Lord. Had opportunities gone. I pray somebody else had the chance because I didn't take it. Walked literally by my house. I'd be out there snowballing sometimes and you'd be walking by and say, how do you? See him again, Fitz. 37 years old. The Lord said, choose this day. Because you may not have tomorrow. <coughs> Who are you going to serve? He says, today I've given you a choice between life and death, between blessing and curses. Now I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Everybody's watching. I'm calling all witnesses. Look down on Destiny Christian Church this morning. And I'm calling them to a decision. You either can say yes, say no, or say nothing like I'm on combat. But if you say nothing, that's saying no. <clears throat> oh, that you would choose life. See, now God's going to help us here a little bit. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Really, Lord. Verse 20 says, you can make this choice. He's not asking you to make a choice you can't make. You can make this choice. He says, by loving the Lord your God. Guess where the onus is? You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God obeying Him and committing yourself firmly to Him. You can make this choice. This is the key to your life. This is the key to life. This is the key to the kingdom life. You love the Lord your God, you obey Him, and you commit yourself firmly to Him. And when you make that choice, it's not only benefits you, but it also benefits your descendants. Because it was a time that looked pretty ugly. Promises you never let go of. He's not the one that doesn't fulfill them. We're the ones that walk away from them. He says, This ain't just for you. When you make that decision, it's for you and your descendants. Somebody's saying, Yabat, get your butt out of the way. There ain't no Yabats. See, because what you see now is irrelevant. Because reality is subject to change. What you see is this. You don't say the now. You see what God sees. Your descendants serving the Lord. This is what you see. Why? Because you made a decision one day. I'm standing. I'm going to be that example. I'm going to love the Lord my God. I'm going to obey Him. And I'm going to commit myself firmly to him. He said, this is the key of life. And if you love and obey the Lord your God, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to you to give your descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what are you going to do? I'm not going to have a formal altar call thing and stuff because I, this morning I'm just, you know, I don't want a decision made out of emotional reaction of what just been said. <clears throat> By the end of the day, tonight, before you pillow your head, God wants you to decide. If not now, when? When you go 
get serious with him? When are you going to get right with him? When are you going to walk in righteousness like he's called you to walk? When are you going to start sharing the testimony with people, sharing the gospel with people? Now, he's already put on my heart, we're going to do this in a few weeks, probably once, maybe when we get through the summer or in the summer, but definitely when we get to the fall. I'm going to show you. I've already put these things on the church Facebook page. You need to look at them and seriously take them to heart. How to share your testimony in 15 seconds with somebody. And how to share the gospel with these three circles that will take maybe a minute and a half to two minutes to share the gospel with somebody. When are we going to get serious and do that? So another Chris walking by your house tonight and I'm dead and find out. All of a sudden, you go in the grocery store and say, hey, where's so-and-so you've been talking to for months? And here no more. They got cancer and they're in the hospital. Only weeks to live. See, that's what this is about. The same about us. It's about him, the ministry he's given us, the ministry of reconciliation, bringing back people back to him. How are we doing that? Are we actively praying for those divine appointments and saying, God, I just don't want to be about my business today. And I've admitted to you guys thousands of times, I have the worst offender of that. I get so anal, I get my tasks, and I overlook divine appointments. In fact, I apologize to you. What was it last week for it? As Gail was sharing about her divine appointment, I'm saying, stink. Now i got to repent. Publicly. We all do. Oh, and again, this is not a condemnation thing. It's a thing, if not now, then when? Because again, we ain't getting no younger. So if we're not going to make that commitment now and choose this day who we're going to serve and do it wholeheartedly, then when? Because you may never get to the when. Because today he's calling us into account. And he's got the witnesses looking. And he says, in case you didn't get it, let me help you. Choose life. Choose life because it's going to benefit you and your heritage. And but you got to obey. you got to love me. you got to obey me and serve me fully. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you, Lord. And Lord, don't let any religious spirit get in and then make this thing crazy as in it turns into legalism with a list of do's and don'ts, because, Lord, you know my heart, that's not what I'm saying, I'm just sensing that now, it's trying to get in and say, oh, that means i got to do this, this, this. No, no, no. It's not a doing, it's an attitude. It's an attitude that will birth a doing. So your attitude is you think it's hard and it's burdensome to serve the Lord, that's why you're not. You've been offended by Him, you've not got it right with Him, like we talked about last week, repented before Him, you're upset with them. You can't open up your heart again because you closed it. So Lord, we just take them perverted, twisted words now in the name of Jesus, cast them to hell from where they came. Because Father, you're a loving God. You're a good God. But Lord, you will also discipline your children. And you will correct us. And Lord, this is a time of correction. It's a time to get back to the main thing, the foundational thing that you've called every one of your kids to. The ministry of reconciliation, bringing others back to you. But Lord, as we do that, we can't leave them hanging either. Because I'm tired of hearing so many people say, oh yeah, I went into Walmart and I led two people to Christ. It's like, where are they? Lord, we're birthing spiritual infants and leaving them out on the curb to be eaten by the wolves. Because, Lord, you're not saying that either. That's why the fivefold is so important, Lord, because you get those people that can equip and train and mother and nurture all that stuff. So, Lord, give us complete understanding and revelation of this, but help us to understand it begins right here in this temple in which we dwell as individuals. Who are we going to serve? Because the thing you told us in Revelation is you hate the woman. You'd rather be hot or rather cold. Lukewarmness you spew out of your mouth. And Lord, forgive us. 
because a lot of us sit in that lukewarmness spot. We're not hot or cold. We're just at that comfortable temperature, that room temperature, doing our own thing, walking our own way, and occasionally, yeah, we'll jump in and out and do something for you, but we're just lukewarm, Lord. So forgive us, Father. But Lord, by your Spirit, I'm asking, again, that each one of us would do business before this day is out, that we would make that decision and we would not be moved from it. Because, Lord, it has eternal consequences along with eternal benefits. Choose life. Thank you, Lord. Choose life. So, Father, as we go from this place now, we go with your blessing, we can encourage, stir, challenge. Most of all, Lord, we've heard from you and met with you. And we leave here changed now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Be blessed, be encouraged.